So let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to Integration of Mental Health in Schools to Improve Student Success. My name is Marisa Perez-Martin. Um, I am the Vice President of School-Based Mental Health and Early Education Services at Hathaway Sycamores. I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist. And good afternoon. My name is Shafali Gasa. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in LPCC. I'm the Assistant Vice President of School-Based Mental Health and Early Education at Hathaway Sycamores. Sorry, the slide is stuck. There it goes. So just to give you a little bit of an agenda today, what we're gonna start off talking about is our school-wide mental health integration program. Um, that's gonna include how to prepare for integration of mental health onto a school environment. Then we will move on to talk a little bit about the services and staffing for our department, um, the barriers that we have ran into, and um, we really value on collecting lots of outcomes. And so we will um, give you an example of how we've done that and also give you examples of um, some of our outcomes reports that we share with everybody and with our school partners. Um, we'll also are gonna make sure to leave some time for questions. Um, we do have some learning objectives and we do hope that as a result of attending this session, you are gonna be able to determine the status of your current efforts and benefits of additional work integrating care with schools um, and give you some problem solving for any barriers that you may have run into um, while doing the efforts to connect with schools. Um, we're gonna review some key words and concepts that help school officials understand mental health and vice versa. And we're gonna identify potential metrics and outcomes to track progress at the universal targeted and individualized tiers of intervention. And we're also gonna review how this has been adapted to fit the COVID-19 environment. Um, finally, um, at the end, we do have an activity that will hopefully um, have you develop an action plan that will foster relationships, finances, and logistics necessary for next steps. Um, first, what we're first gonna do is try to get some participation and kind of see who is in our audience today. And so the first step is going to menti.com. And once you reach menti.com, you are going to put in the code 4511 982. So again, if everyone can go to menti.com and the code is 4511982. I believe the first code has also been put in the chat. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to head over. So this is great. It looks like we're already starting to see um, some of the roles that our audience is in. So we have mental health specialists, youth advocate, resource navigators, social workers, wellness center staff, an analyst, MPH student, project manager. So great variety. Awesome. Lots of mental health specialists in the audience. Yeah, it's great. Oh, LVN. That's great. That's awesome. Great. Yeah, that's good. An outpatient manager that just popped in. 
health health educators too. That's great. That's fantastic. Yeah. Okay, we'll come back to Menti at the end. Let me just go back to our presentation. Okay. okay, so now that we know what your roles are, let me tell you a little bit about who um, Hathaway Sycamores is. So we are a community-based organization um, serving roughly almost 7,000 youth and families in the Los Angeles County area, uh, Los Angeles County area. We have um, 10 locations of care throughout LA County. And throughout LA County, we do offer a wide array of mental health services. Um, throughout our 10 locations, we have outpatient services, community-based services, um, school-based services. We do have an STRTP located in Altadena, California. Um, and our, some of our locations offer wraparound services, prevention and early intervention, full service partnership, and also therapeutic behavioral services. So one of the things that you'll see is that our agency really provides services um, from people whose this is their first time needing mental health services all the way up to a higher level of care where they're needing full service partnership wrap or even an STRTP. Um, what we're focusing today is the continuum of school-based and education services that we have developed um, since 1997. In 1997, our CEO and president thought that to increase access of care for mental health services, it would be great to partner with our sister agencies and a small school district and actually put mental health providers on school campuses for 40 hours a week, which started off with four schools in 1997, has now evolved to um, 35 campuses throughout Los Angeles County. Um, we also have birth to five services. We do have a contract with um, Head Starts called Plaza de la Raza. And I wanna say they have about 30 um, preschools throughout LA County. Um, and they will send us referrals. So usually what that process looks like is they will provide about four or five sessions um, of therapy themselves with their interns. And if um, the families need more services, then they will um, contract with us. And then we will provide um, individual rehabilitation in the home, individual and family therapy in the community or in the Head Start. And we also do offer adjunct services, um, things like uh, medication support and co-occurring. Um, we also provide support to the parents. Um, our school-based mental health is kind of our next level in our continuum of school-based services. And that's throughout 35 schools throughout LA County. Um, and it's individual and family therapy on school campuses, also individual rehab and adjunct services. We'll talk a little bit about the staffing of that in a bit, um, but really the goal is that we have uh, teams of a mental health therapist and a bachelor's level um, community wellness specialist on the school campuses. Finally, in our continuum of school-based and education services, we do have um, educationally related mental health services. Um, our goal was to really be kind of a step between um, a non-public before a general education classroom or special education classroom and a non-public school. So we have created um, therapeutic classrooms on general education school campuses. And inside those therapeutic classrooms, we do have a therapist, a teacher, and two behavioral specialists that can provide um, support. And the goal is to not take kids away from their school environment, but really integrate them into um, their school campuses. 
When we're looking at some of the definitions, um, and so we are both in public schools and charter schools. But public schools are traditional public schools, they're tied to school districts, and they set their curriculums based on state education standards. And they're primarily funded through state budgets, um, but primarily through local taxes. Um, another partner that we have is a lot of our public schools do have community schools on the campuses. And they are, we do a lot of partnering with them because they're able to identify the services that are needed um, for their students. And they're also able to refer to us um, when the students do need mental health services. Um, the other uh, schools that we work with too are also charter schools. And charter schools are public schools that are independent of school districts through contracts with state or local boards. And they're funded on a per pupil basis with government funds and can sometimes receive private funding, but typically receive less funding overall. Ideally, even if it's a public school or a charter school, the most important thing is that our model of school-based mental health looks exactly the same on both of these types of campuses. The other thing too that you might hear with school-based services is school-based services or school link services. We do think that it's best practice that services are school-based. And so what that means is our teams of a therapist and a community wellness specialist, they have assigned office space and they also have assigned confidential space to be able to provide the family therapy, the individual therapy, everything on the school campus. Our goal is also really to become part of the culture of the school campus. We wanna work with the school nurses. We wanna work with the school psychologists. We wanna have conversations with the principals and really just be part of the school community. And so that's why we've learned that school-based services being on there 40 hours a week, all year round, really allows us to be part of that fabric of the school. It also gives us the opportunity to have collateral visits um, with teachers and it really increases the access to mental health services um, and the ability for parents to participate in services also because parents are picking up their kids from school and also dropping off their kids at school. School link services, um, it's really more of an agreement with the school to provide services to the students, but more on a like drop in um, drop in time. So they might not be there all day. They might be there for two or three hours, see a few can few see a few of the students, and then leave the school. Um, and so that's another type of delivery service that some community based organizations do have. So. The services that we provide on the school campus are individual therapy, individual rehabilitation services, case management, family therapy, crisis intervention, and group therapy. Because we do have that confidential space on the campus, we're able to provide all these services on um, the campus. Um, I also wanted to note too that you know, in addition, we're doing psychoeducation to the teachers and to the principals. We're also there for crisis response, for crisis intervention. Um, and who's providing the services? So we hire clinicians, either licensed or with their intern number, and they really focus on providing all of these services on the campus. Um, our community wellness specialists, our bachelor's level staff, and they provide interventions that can develop um, coping and problem solving skills to promote safety and attachment and teach transference of those skills into the home, to the school and the community. This is one of the great things about being on a school campus is that if um, that the services can happen on the playground, they can happen in the classroom. So if there is, you know, a little guy that's just having a really hard time staying seated or is just really dysregulated, then the community wellness specialist is able to sit besides that student and really get them to um, integrate these skills that they're learning in therapy and kind of just, you know, in vivo right there, practice those skills that they're learning. 
Um, it's also really great for the teachers because the teachers are also watching what um, coping skills are working for specific students and then they're able to integrate sometimes with a group of students or even sometimes with their whole classrooms. Um, social skills, this is great because our CWSs can be out on the playground um, teaching the kids and students just different social skills that they can implement um, to stop bullying or to actually participate in activities um, and, and um, make more friends. So I'm gonna talk about the benefits of integrating care with schools. So there are a lot of different benefits that come out of actually doing school-based services where the school-based where the services are on the campus. So it definitely improves the school climate in all of the schools that we're in. Once we get in there, our outcomes, our data, our consumer satisfaction surveys, we do surveys with community partners, those surveys come out really positive once we are on the campus full time because there is a general sense of a lot more collaboration, a lot more kind of holistic approach to helping the students um, reach you know, academic success levels. It increases access to care. So we capture a lot more students because we are there 40 hours a week. So what happens in cases is teachers just pop into our office and say, you know, this is something, you know, is happening with a student, should I make a referral? And it's really easy for them. So it really increases access to questions about mental health for teachers, staff, um, any principals, vice principals, anybody involved, guidance counselors, um, people like that. So it really just makes things a lot easier in terms of care for the students. It integrates with community schools initiatives. So there are this, these initiatives have been uh, pretty prevalent, I'd say, especially in the last year, but I know they've existed prior. We have some schools that are impacted now heavily with community schools initiatives, and it's actually been nothing but positive. It's really increased referrals. It's increased, again, a really holistic level of care because now in some of the campuses that we're in, there are school-based health centers. And so we've been collaborating with those school-based health centers to really increase referrals, check-ins, crisis intervention, things like that. It integrates with positive behavior intervention and supports, which is PBIS. So any initiatives around PBIS on campus get integrated with our initiatives. And so some schools have even talked to us about you know, doing tier one, tier two, work with students in addition to our tier three um, work that we're already doing with the students that have a higher level of care that's required. It's additional support for crisis intervention. So I think this is another area where schools really enjoy having us on campus because not only do we do crisis intervention for students that we are already providing care to, but when we build in our contracts or agreements with schools where we are doing school-based services, we agree upon us doing crisis intervention, no matter if it's one of our clients or not. And what it does is it really provides this level of mental health support and it really holds the student. And then it really allows the staff at the school to focus on all of the logistical things that may need to be in place in order to manage the crisis. It increases opportunities to train education staff in mental health. So one of the things that we do because we're providing school-based services is that it's really easy for us to go to a teacher meeting every, you know, every other Monday and provide education about mental health topics. And we have had schools that asked us to do a series of those just so that teachers get, and we do it for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. They're not very long, but it really gives teachers the opportunity to understand more about mental health, symptoms, signs, diagnoses, um, intervention ideas, and then it gives them a venue to really ask questions and for us to answer and support them. It also increases access to therapy, behavioral interventions, and other adjunctive services that we provide like substance use counseling and medication support. 
So our students that we work with get a really comprehensive level of care when there are clients and those supports can also be provided in the schools. So if they need any substance use support, we can do that in the schools. Our psychiatrists do everything via telehealth. They were doing that prior to COVID. And so that was really convenient and students could just come to the school and do a telepsychiatry session. So it's been, it's been really useful and helpful in terms of the adjunct of supports we provide. So how do we get to be a school-based provider on the campus? So here are the steps that we have found really initiate a successful partnership. So the first thing we do is identify a school and or a school district with an underserved population and or a lack of resources. So that could be, you know, attending conferences, talking to people, talking to, you know, clients that mental health agencies are already working with and saying, you know, what school do you attend? Or, you know, there's lots of different ways to network to find out that information. And then setting up a meeting with either the principal or the assistant principal, a school counselor, or any other district staff if you're talking directly with the whole district. And setting up that meeting is important because it's the first initiation to talk about the potential for a school-based services partnership. And when meeting, these are the points that we have decided are really important to know before we initiate a partnership. So we want to know the census. So we definitely wanna know how many students are in the school and how many, um, how many teachers, things like that, because the smaller the school, the less potential for referrals. And typically our kind of magic number has been anywhere between like, I would say like 275 students and up. And the reason for that is our model is a school-based model where we are on campus 40 hours a week, our team is. And so in order to ensure that our team is occupied full-time 40 hours per week, we have found that typically them holding anywhere between 15 to 22 cases is a good amount any, any time of the year. Sometimes those levels drop depending on seasonality. But overall, if you are in a school with 275 students or more, and it's an underserved population, you should be able to sustain a full-time team and get enough referrals to, um, to provide enough services to, to, um, to meet your budget. Um, you wanna look at the needs. So we always talk about needs. You know, what are, what's happening on the school campus? What are students struggling with? What are families struggling with? So assessing all those things is really important because that gives you a good idea of what kind of services are gonna be needed on campus. The strengths of the school. So we definitely cover strengths. We want to know, you know, a big strength we wanna know about is whether or not, you know, the school staff support mental health or if they've had experience with mental health providers. We also wanna know what the school is already doing to support mental health and academic success because many schools that we are in have a lot of really great programs that they have brought into the campus like Big Brothers Big Sisters or they have really amazing tutoring programs that support students. And the reason we wanna know those things is because we want to partner with those services because when we do that, the students really get a comprehensive level of care. We want to know about languages and cultures, and this definitely helps us in terms of the staff that we are going to place on the campus. So if we know that the campus has mostly Spanish-speaking parents or caregivers, we are going to try our best to hire a bilingual clinician and even a bilingual community wellness specialist so that they can do parenting groups, they can do um, all different kinds of other services, including case management in the parents or caregivers native languages. We wanna know, we, we talk about best practices in school-based mental health. So we basically talk about our model like we're doing right now. We talk about outcomes measurement. So we cover with the school or the school district 
the types of outcomes that we look at and what we use to determine those outcomes so that they're aware about the data that we're gonna be able to provide to them because of the utilization of our outcomes. We talk about integration with school staff and processes. So this again is more about the teaming and how it's a really whole school approach that we get into when we get into a campus because we really do become a part of the school staff and the school staff love it because they love you know, working with us and really having us on campus as a resource. We talk about all the different services we provide like therapy and group and behavior rehabilitation, case management, medication support, all those great services. We cover our referral process. So how referrals need to be generated and come in and what we need from the school in order to open cases. We talk about space. So this is a big one. So if this is really gonna happen, you need space on the campus. And we tell the schools, we really need a permanent space. And it's never really an issue. Sometimes there are bumps in the road, but when schools find out we want their, we're gonna be there 40 hours a week, they do a lot to try to find space for us to keep us on campus 40 hours a week. So it's really, it's really interesting how, where we've been in terms of space, we've had PE closets and different places like that, but we make it work and we make it confidential. So those are the two things it said is needs to be confidential space with the door um, to ensure the students and any other clients confidentiality. We tour the school and confirm the space. So when the school says we have space, we actually tour the space, go check it out, kind of envision what this is gonna look like to make sure that the students can be in the space with a clinician and that there's enough space to actually provide the services. And then very important is to sign an MOU or a service delivery agreement. So you definitely wanna do that before you provide services just to ensure that everybody's on the same page. And then you wanna set up a time to present at various teacher meetings, PTA meetings, school site meetings, any meeting you can get, get into to talk about your services is beneficial because the more you get the word out, the more referrals it's gonna generate and the more involvement um, with the school that you're gonna get because everyone's going to know that you are there. So on the school side, here are some steps that schools can initiate. So the school, prior to meeting with a community-based organization like us, the school can assess the needs. So talking in meetings about, hey guys, you know, we wanna bring in a school-based mental health provider. What do you think the needs are? What do we need? How do we foresee them providing services? Things like that. Talking with mental health agencies. So kind of dating, right? So you don't, you know, school doesn't have to be wedded to one provider. And actually the schools that we are in, we are not the only provider. They've all have at least one other provider and high schools typically have, I don't know, somewhere between four to six providers just because the census is so high and the needs can be really large with a large school uh, population. We identify I'm sorry, we inform school administration. So the school would need to inform the school administration, let them know that they're interested in working with a mental health agency to bring the services on campus, identifying a future space. So if the school can do that prior to bringing in the agency for a meeting, that would be really great because for school-based services, the agency is gonna say, hey, do you have space on campus that we can provide these services? So you definitely want to do that piece. Work with the school and the district to forge partnerships. So letting the district know, so letting a principal know that this is what is interest, you know, what the school is looking for. Or if it's the principal, the principal can go to the district and say, you know, we'd like to form this partnership. And typically in signing the agreement, there usually is somebody from the district signing off on the agreement. Um, school stakeholders and mental health agencies. So once there's kind of this like marriage, right? So you did some dating, looked into different agencies, and now you're, you're kind of, you know, getting married to each other. So you wanna review the referral process. You wanna ask the community-based organization for brochures, 
flyers, other promotional materials, any referral forms that they need, you know, getting all the information up front so that the school can disseminate everything and really get the school staff involved in making referrals or even understanding, hey, this provider is gonna be on campus, let's use them to provide these great mental health supports. Check-in meetings. So we highly recommend that schools do monthly check-in meetings with community-based organizations. So I know on our side, we, all of our schools, we do a monthly check-in meeting. This is about any barriers, questions, maybe referrals were put in by the school. And so that gives the school an opportunity to say, hey, what happened to John Doe? We referred him and it's been a month and he's not in services and there's still concerns about his academics or his health and where, where are we at in the process? So it gives this carved out time to really check in on how things are going with referrals or with students that have been referred and are in services. And then an end of year review to analyze, reassess, tweak things. And sometimes the agency, uh, the school will say, you know, we don't want to review, renew the agreement because, you know, we're not happy with your services. Um, that personally hasn't happened to us. What they have, if there is an agreement that doesn't continue, it's because the school just can't generate enough referrals to have us there as a school-based provider. So then what we do is just go to a school-linked model, and then we may get one of our community-based sites to actually take over servicing that school on a more school-linked type of service delivery model. And then our staff would go into get integrated into another school that maybe has a lot more needs the following year and could use a whole other team. So whole school preparation. So what do we need? So every we really, really spend a lot of time on data. So really looking at all the data points that I talked about before, looking at needs, looking at facilities, where will the agency work from? Does the faculty, staff, and, and administration know that our agency is on campus? Who are the members of the school's mental health team? So when we first go onto a campus, we introduce our team and tell them to go to every single meeting they can get into because it just adds a lot more personal connection when teachers, school staff, PTA uh, volunteers, when they can see that we're there, it really makes it more comfortable to turn in the referrals and to really connect with us. Faculty awareness, so does, our, does the school know about the mental health partner? Inclusion in school events. So we do tables at open house, um, obviously not during COVID, but we have been attending back to school nights and open house events and other meetings virtually. So principals have invited us to come in and pop in on a Zoom and present about our services, answer any questions. And then once we're done, we leave. So we're still doing it, we're just doing it virtually, but you know, hopefully this is all gonna go back to normal or the new normal. And then we will be working that out with schools to figure out how to continue doing what we were doing. We've also volunteered at community events on the weekend. So with one of our school districts, we've they said, hey, do you wanna come and work um, the food bank on a Saturday? Do you have to staff? and?" You know, our staff are like, yeah, let's go. So we go and help there and talk about our services, but also just help, you know, help at the food bank from the school. So a lot of really great opportunities when you're on the campus 40 hours because they know that you're there. Um, referrals, so getting referrals ready. So now that you're kind of married, you want to get the referrals ready to start sending. Because when we, when we sign that agreement, we're ready. We're, our agency is saying, send us the referrals. We have staff available. We're ready to service your school. And then advertise the partnership. So get us, you know, get the agency on the website. Schools can do a lot of different things. They can put, you know, um, a flyer in the school, you know, folders, you know, elementary school kind of like Thursday folders like my kids have, or put it up on the website or post it in places where students can see. So a lot of different opportunities for the partnership to be advertised. 
So what are some of the barriers? So some of the barriers that we encounter are confident identifying space on campus, um, school staff not supporting mental health, not receiving referrals, you know, there's a lot of them here. And then on the right, we've listed some solutions about how to overcome some of the barriers so that um, we're receiving referrals. And, and so really the students are getting the care they need and they're able to access the care. And there are a lot of barriers that come up at the beginning and we really work with schools to problem solve. And so the schools that we've been in, there's one in the 15 years that I've been doing this that we didn't continue. All the other schools that we've added, we have continued. We've overcome a lot of different barriers in problem solving to make sure that we can get in and really have a successful partnership and so students can get the care that they need. So in a COVID environment, here are some of the things that we've had to address. So we've had to address technology and I'm sure all of you are familiar with doing this at this point. Um, we have worked to get tablets to students. We have worked with school districts to get um, children their Chromebooks. We have, we've done a lot. We even at one point um, through a grant, we were able to purchase uh, you know, Wi-Fi hotspots for our clients just so that we could address the digital divide and really get them up and running on video conferencing sessions with us so that we could provide the best care. Engaging families with technology. So we have been working on this. It's getting better and better all the time. Um, but initially it was, it was a, a definitely a barrier to overcome. Maintaining communication with school districts, school personnel, principals. And so we really worked on basically making that whole process electronic. So we, you know, PDF fillable forms so that they can be easily emailed to us, eliminating some barriers so that, you know, caregivers can consent to services and they can do that verbally and the school can get the documents they need to attach the referral and send it to us. So we've done a lot of things to streamline and make it easier for those referrals to come in through email so that the schools didn't have to worry about, you know, handwriting forms and printing things and, you know, trying to figure out. And then we've also educated a lot of the schools on how to identify students that need assistance. And, um, and so, and need to be referred for mental health services. So that's been really successful and we're still continuing to do that as school, schools give us time. But that I think has been the most fruitful because we've been able to really point out to teachers and staff, you know, here are the things to look for. You know, you're not physically there, but here are some things virtually, signs that something is going wrong and that this student could benefit from mental health. Because once they refer to us, we can make contact with the caregiver, provide that caregiver with support, check in. And so the onus falls on us and then it frees up the school staff to then focus on the academics. And that has been really great for the schools that we're in right now. Um, and then just monitoring new data. So we've been really, as an agency, looking at the frequency of in-person versus video sessions versus phone. And we've also been really diligent about you know, safe, socially distanced, in-person contact with PPE with students who have DCFS involvement because we definitely want those, um, we don't want those students falling through the cracks. So we've done a lot of work to make sure that we can safely uh, check in on those students and do in-person sessions so that they're safe. So we do focus a lot on data and the purpose of this is really to be able to, at the end of the year, create some data points and data reports, go back to our school partners and let them know this is how many students we've seen through our services. These are the most popular diagnoses that are coming in. Um, this is where some of the students were when they started with services and where now they're ending with services. Um, but before even getting to this place of just collecting the data, 
we really had to, as an agency, foster a data-driven culture, which took a while um, because we went from this place of getting so much data, we didn't know what to do, then getting limited data, and it's really finding that happy medium of what data we actually wanted to collect. And so what we did to foster this culture was we collaborated with our stakeholders, we collaborated with our principals, with our, um, you know, our SELPA directors and our directors, what, what, what outcomes would be beneficial to them at the end of the school year. And then we monitor it on a every, you know, six months to every year, we monitor the data. And then we're constantly reassessing with our stakeholders to see what they would like to see different when we present um, the data back to them. So some of the sample of our performance metrics specifically for the schools is we're monitoring things like attendance and academic performance and graduation rates and college career preparation. We're also monitoring safety. We do something called a safety and crisis plan and special incident reports. And part of our reports that we give back to the schools is how many special incident reports we've written for their district or for their school in that school year. Um, we're also monitoring satisfaction on a yearly basis. Are the students satisfied with the services that they're receiving? Um, is the school district and the school teachers and everyone on the school campus also satisfied with the services um, that we're providing? And finally, we are um, monitoring clinical functioning measures. So every six months, our students are getting youth outcome questionnaires or the PSCs, the pediatric symptom checklist. And, you know, some data points actually changed when COVID happened in March. And so now what we are monitoring is how many of these students are we actually seeing in person using PPE? How many are we seeing through telehealth with our video on? And how many are participating just through phones during COVID? These are just some examples of the reports that we give to our community partners at the end of each school year. So for example, this is for our service area too. This is really with our schools in the LA Unified School District. And in one year, we provided services to 442 youth. Um, the average length of services was 11.7 months. The most common um, diagnosis during that year was a mood disorder. And the bottom graph is the uh, caregivers, where the caregivers reported a decrease in the use distress from the beginning of services to the end of services. And also we keep track of where are these students living. And in this year, 99% of the youth were living in a home-like setting. This has been adapted with COVID, and this is an example of what we are tracking. So we are tracking how many phone sessions our therapists are having compared to how many video sessions, um, because we do think it's so important to have eyes on our students during this time. Um, so you can see there, one clinician was really focused on doing phone and video, but we had another therapist that at least did 6% of in-person service during that two weeks. We do track it on a two week basis. She did 6% of phone and 80% of her services are video. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner, that's really as a whole agency, what we are striving for. So we are tracking this in a like bigger macro level. And the in-person is the blue. So 26% of our services are still in person using PPE. 32% of our services are video and our phone is at 42%. And we do have goals. Our goal is that 80% of our services are done either, 80% are done in person and video with 20% just being um, uh, services over the phone. These are just some more samples of what our reports look like. Um, these are related to our special education program, and these are reports that are given at the end of the year. It's kind of like our end of the year report card, letting the schools and the districts know what the year in review was. Um, this is a sample of our consumer satisfaction. So our students do get um, surveys every year um, and to give us feedback on how they think that where our, our mental health teams are doing. 
And we also do a community partner satisfaction. So this is really goes out to our teachers, any of our referral sources will provide um, some feedback through our uh, community partner satisfaction survey. Sorry, I was muted. So now we're just gonna take the last few minutes and brainstorm about developing partnerships with community-based organizations or community-based organizations developing partnerships with schools or school districts. So you're gonna go back to menti.com and we're gonna get that up in a second. If you can go to menti.com, the code that you're going to put in, I will put it in the chat so you can get prepared. I've put it it's in the good. chat. Okay, great. Okay. So the first, so the code is 7832364. And the first question is, who does your organization partner with for mental health services? Just wait a second. You can use your phone or your computer, either one. We have some answers coming in. Okay, so Department of Public Health and CBOs. Okay, great. The LA, okay, County Office of Education, County Mental Health Collaborative. Okay, that's great. Seneca, LAUSD School Mental Health. We're a county behavioral wellness partner with schools throughout our county for on campus. Great. Public schools, awesome. Local school districts, great. Kern BHRS, I'm guessing that's behavioral health, I'm guessing. Wellness, okay, and wellness, awesome. Local nonprofits, county crisis response team, county office of education, okay. I'm not sure, I was just told by my boss, our board just approved a mental health service. Great, that's awesome. So this is a good presentation for you because now you're gonna have a lot of questions for them. Okay, awesome. And then free community-based mental health services, youth advocate programs and children's mental health and more. Okay, fantastic. We'll wait just a second to see if there's any more replies. Okay, this is great. Okay, I say let's go to the next question. I just press enter, right? Just to move to the next one? I think so, yeah. Okay. Nope. Or the, is there an arrow? There it goes. Oh, there. Okay. So what do you value from a partnership? So this is a ranking question. Okay, this is good. We'll see what, what the group, okay. It's so cool to see how the bars change. <laughs> As everybody replies, it's great. Wow, 
Wow, so it looks like quality of services and access to care are pretty neck and neck. And then regular collaboration and then utilization of data. Okay, quality of services took a bump. Great. Oh, interesting. Okay, access and regular collaboration are kind of tied. So this, so this question was to help you all see kind of what, as a group, you know, what everybody attending, what are, what are, what do you value from a partnership? Because it's great information for you all to take away, to think about. Okay, you know, I went to this presentation as a group. People were really interested in the quality of services, and wow, and then regular collaboration just kind of went up. So, so these are great point talking points when you are working with, uh, working to establish a partnership, you know, what are, so it looks like the top, top two things are looking at the quality of services and regular collaboration. And it's interesting because utilization of data is at the bottom, but if you want to monitor the quality of services, you definitely want to have utilization of data. So those are services, you know, you want to evaluate the services and if the agency can do it, you would want them to provide outcomes data um, because that's going to tell you the quality of services and our consumer satisfaction surveys really help us get us, you know, get us um, to have our pulse on what our clients are saying and what our areas of improvement are. Great. So next question, what do you see as the benefits of school-based mental health services? So this is just a word cloud. Okay, student wellness, immediate support, direct services, destigmatizing, that's a great one, integration, suspension reduction, awesome, quick access to services, psychoeducation, that's a good one, social justice, yes, equity, access, yes, integration, staff support, that's another really good one, direct services, Okay, access definitely seems to be the big one. Great. Oh, connection with parents, connection with student body. Wow, these are really good. Awesome. Ending the stigma. Consistent support, safe place for students. Yeah. Wellness for all, accessibility for all. Yeah, totally agree. So access and student wellness, healthier relationships, great. Awesome. All, those are all benefits. I mean, that's the great thing. Linking to services, low income can access, yeah. The accessibility piece of school-based mental health is definitely like really, really important and a huge benefit, great. I think we have one more. If you have any questions, you can note them in the chat, by the way. And then we, if we have a few minutes at the end, we can certainly answer them. It's not going. It's not going. Oh, it's like stuck.
Is it the last slide maybe, Marisa? It might be the last. Oh, there it goes. Okay. This last must be the last one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, assessing school mental health needs. Yeah, that's a big one. You definitely want to do that first. Capacity to provide services, yes. Determining what's nearby. Mm hmm Okay. That looks good. Assessing, assess it, yeah. Assessing the school mental health needs and the, prof you know, if you're coming from the school side, which I think most people are here, um, yeah, definitely assessing and your, like assessing the needs and the capacity is really, really important. Yeah, but it looks like most of you believe assessing the needs is the most important. Great. Oh, sorry, one more. This might be the last one. How do you use outcomes to evaluate your services? No one's using outcomes. It's totally okay to put, we're not using them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to inform quality of service, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. Assess what's working and what needs to be tweaked or replaced. Yeah. Yes, that's a big one. Okay, we've got one more minute. Outcomes help to, my Zoom is blocking, to determine if specific populations are being underserved. Yeah, that's a really good one. Determine if interventions are effective, quality of services, how it may have affected the priority population. Okay, quality of services. So yeah, definitely quality of services and um, what needs to be changed, replaced, for sure. Eliminated, sometimes there are things that need to be eliminated because families aren't using the interventions. See what services are utilized the most. Yes, we do that. That's part of our evaluation is to see what services are families engaging in the most. Mm -hmm. We use data platform for both outcome measures and LEA billing. Okay. Yep. This data to feed our MTSS. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I'd just like to know okay. it is 1.30, so the um, ending session is about to begin. I don't know if you want okay. to take another minute to to end and then attendees, you can, yeah. after a minute, we can head over. Yeah. Yeah, we can wrap up. I think that's the last question anyway, so. And are there any questions in the chat at all? There are no questions currently. Okay. Um, if there are any questions, Marisa, do you want to put up the slide with our, our, oh, so we'll yeah. give our contact information. Oops. 
sorry. You can contact us with any questions that you have. Drop us an email. We're happy to help respond, give you examples of anything that you want to know about. There you go. And that's our contact info. Sorry. Perfect. Thank you so much, Marissa Shafali, for this amazing presentation. I really, I know I really enjoyed myself too. Um, and Great. if any of the attendees, if you have any questions, um, you will be able to find their information and the video will be posted as well. So, yep. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate Great. everyone's time. Thank you, everyone. Thank Hopefully you, everybody.